Over the past two years, we've done several stories over the Edmond Police Department, and we've learned about the academy that new recruits have to go through and why the officers do what they do. We've talked about their training and their equipment, and for the past couple of months, we've brought the Edmond Way series to you, talking about police procedures and the use of force by the police department. On this month's episode, and by the way, it is an hour-long episode of Your Edmond, we'll be going into a lot more depth on the purpose of the Edmund Way series. We're talking to several people who have helped make the series a possibility, and we'll premiere the newest segment of the Edmund Way series. Hi, and welcome to this month's episode of Your Edmund. Today, I'm joined by a very special guest. Now, normally, he's running the camera, and he's behind the scenes on Your Edmund, but today, uh, Dwight, just come on out. Hey, Eric, how's it going? Good to see you in front of the camera. Yeah. Phone. That's what you look like. Yes. Normally you have a, uh, but listen, for the past, what, seven or eight months, you've been involved in the production of Edmund Way. Now, tell me, why is this program so important that we're dedicating an entire hour to focusing on that? What, what, what gives? What All right, well, well, we've been doing this program for a while now, and we've always had a purpose to lead up to a particular subject, and that being lethal force. You know, we've done them over tasing, we've done one over yes. a domestic disturbance, even an arrest. Right. Uh, this one is actually a little bit more serious, and it's what we've always intended for it to be. Mm -hmm. Now, before we, we show that particular one, mm -hmm. uh, I did get a chance to talk with several people from the police department about the making of the series, how the idea came along, uh, the goal and the purpose of it. That sounds very interesting. Uh, can we take a look? Yeah, let's look at it. All right. All right, well, thank you guys for joining me today. Uh, today I've got uh, Chief Bob Briggs here with me, Sergeant Jeff Richardson and Detective David Otwell talking about the Edmund Way. Uh, guys, um, we've been working on this for quite some time, for a few months now. Can you tell me how the Edmund Way videos first came about? They first came about actually um, due to the chief. Chief Ricks wanted me to go before the COPS Leadership Council to try to determine a way that we could try to educate our citizens about police use of force. Uh, during the discussion at the COPS Leadership Council, they determined the best way was probably be to do short video segments to try to portray some video with our officers using force to try to kind of relay that information to our citizens on how we use force. So what is the COPS Leadership Council? The COPS Leadership Council is actually short for Community Oriented Policing Leadership Council. It's kind of like any other board or commission that the City of Edmond has. Um, it was developed in 1997 by the City of Edmond and it consists of nine citizens who are appointed by the mayor and confirmed by the City Council. Uh, their main goal and objective is to assist the police department in identifying policing priorities and uh, providing information to help you know, establish those goals and assist with uh, the priorities that you know, we seek to try to um, identify. So when you brought this idea that uh, Chief Riggs had told you about the video, when you brought it to the council, what was their reaction? Very positive. Uh, they thought it was definitely something that we wanted to try to do to educate our citizens. So we call these videos the Edmund Way. And Jeff, I know you've said, when we were just talking about the Edmund Way, you said, yeah, the, the chief says that all the time. So. You know, Chief, what is the Edmund Way? We think in Edmund that, uh, that we are a special place in which to live, that we don't try to do what is average or what is uh, just expected. We believe in excellence and going above and beyond. So when we came up with the thought of the Edmund Way with regard to doing a video, what we're trying to do is, is demonstrate the professionalism of the officers of the Edmond Police Department, that they are concerned about the residents of Edmond, they're concerned about the image that they project, they're concerned about the, the use of force or any uses of force uh, uh, related to that in ensuring that we are doing it the right way for the right reasons at the right time. Did we know that these were gonna be a series? Of, I mean, initially we were gonna do several of these at one time and was there a specific goal for that? When it started off, it was uh, we wanted to show f why police officers use force, and specifically Edmund police officers. And uh, it kind of 
took on other parts of it where we were able to show um, the professionalism of the officers and and um, the service attitude that we have. But um, it was always going to be somewhat of a series, you know, at least a few videos here and there. But uh, but it, it definitely became bigger than what we planned. And Chief, you know, you've uh, we've talked. You've worked at the federal level. You've worked at the state level. Uh, did you? Working in those different agencies, do you see a need for these types of videos for the public? I do. I, I think that uh, we oftentimes, and I go back to uh, at the federal level, we all oftentimes would do uh, like special events with a certain group. We would target a certain group and then uh, do a, a media relations with, say, a certain group, such as we'd get broadcasters in and, and we would role play and something like that. But here we had the opportunity because of the nature of Edmund is to produce a video that doesn't just target a special group but in, encompasses the entire community. So it, it enables us for people to have a better understanding of who we are and why and, and uh, how we do things. Do you know if there's any other police departments that produce videos like this or try to explain you know, t types of forests or anything? There are other police departments that produce videos. I don't think there'd been any quite like what we're doing. We're role playing, uh, trying to show the citizens on exactly what officers go, you know, uh, what officers are doing in regard to use of force. Uh, so the role playing method is a little different, and I don't know if it's ever been, it, it might have been used before uh, by other police departments, but I have never seen that before. Yeah, mostly they've, they've taken the form of public service announcements on particular subjects, but what we've done is taken multiple subjects but have wrapped them around scenarios and tried to do it in a real life setting. I think that's what's unusual about the Edmund Way videos. And we're going to talk a little bit about that kind of the production of what we did. But I wanted to know, has the police, the police, the Edmund Police Department, what has been their response to seeing the videos and seeing some of their comrades uh, out there helping out with some of these videos as well. Sometimes the chief is the last to know, so I'll defer. I think officers are, are, are generally positive about it. Um, the, when they see it, they're encouraged by it. They're, they're happy to see us putting ourselves in a positive light and trying to educate the citizens that we work for. I think one thing I'd like to add is that on every one of these, we gave the officers the opportunity to view these uh, before they were finally released. And, and we had some constructive comments that we end up modifying the videos to reflect concerns of the officer. So we tried to make it a participatory situation. So not only if they, uh, if they were not involved in the production, at least they had the opportunity to comment and get their voices heard. We probably used upwards of uh, maybe 15 other officers that have helped us out with the, these. Uh, can you tell me a little about uh, these officers, how they were chosen to be in our Edmund Way series? From the initial meeting when we would all get together and, and discuss the uh, topic for the video, we would um, then decide on who was going to be a content expert for us. So we decide on who was going to be um, role players or officers that were, were initiating um, a stop or whatever, but then we also decided on who would represent our department as our content expert. Um, I think it gave us the unique ability to be able to put that out there and show just the quality of, of officers that we have at Edmond and the level of knowledge and expertise that, that each individual has. Well, let's talk a little bit about the ones that we did. The first one, of course, was just a standard uh, pullover. That was the one with Brian Weathers. Uh, David, do you remember a little bit about that one at all? Uh, yes, I do. <laughs> uh, Brian's a very unique individual, great officer. Uh, he's out at the training division, um, very, very sharp with what he does. Of course, he spent many years on the street prior to going to the training division, so he is like a subject matter expert in regard to conducting traffic stops. That's what he trains in the academy, uh, among other things as well. Uh, but having him uh, do the video in regard to uh, conducting a traffic stop based on a violation, he did an excellent job. Uh, the second one we did was with AC, uh, and it was talking about, and Jeff too, that was the one where you were arrested. You. Yes. <laughs> and you have a, a phobia of being in the back seat of a police car. I didn't know it till then. <laughs> yeah, handcuffed in the back seat of a police car, not fun. <laughs> um, third one, of course, was one of my favorites, the domestic dispute one. Uh, those guys did a really good job, and, uh, and I think that's actually probably the most watched one on our YouTube site. A lot of people are really checking that one out. Um, then we had 
Another fun one was the High Speed Pursuit. Uh, that was also with you, Jeff. It was Redemption. Yeah. <laughs> and where, where did we shoot that at? Actually out at the uh, Fire Department's training, training Center, out at Covell and I-35. So we weren't really on a real street no, driving crazy. not at all. Yeah, <laughs> just all. out there on the, so thanks to the Fire Department for uh, letting us come out there and shoot, and actually shooting here today, this morning. Um, the, the fourth, or the fifth one that we did was uh, driving under the influence, a DUI, but I don't know, is it called a DUI? With it, if it's not alcohol, it, it was? Yeah. Okay, so it's DUI, a DUI. DUI, actually. A DUI, DUI. And then, of course, we had the sixth one, was, which was the taser. Chad Langley, that was the police officer in that, he was more than just a police officer there. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about Chad's involvement with that whole story and, and uh, his experience with tasers? Yeah, uh, Sergeant Langley is, is uh, not just a patrol supervisor, he's also our less lethal expert for the agency, for our entire department. He's in charge of tasers and, and beanbag shotguns and all, all less lethal um, means that we have and we deploy at the Edmond Police Department. So um, because of that, we wanted to use him to distribute the message of, of why we use um, tasers and, and how they're effective. Right. When we initially came up with the scenario, uh, Chad had some reluctance. Be a couple of factors there. One, the concern that we might reveal tactics. Uh, two, is that we may be trapping our officers saying this is the only uh, weapon that we could use under the circumstance. And so what we did, like I indicated earlier, we went back to the officers. In this case, we went back to Chad and said, okay, Chad, you design a scenario. Uh, and, and what we did was we let him completely changed what we had done initially trying to script what we were going to do and he came up with a, with a very workable scenario. Uh, another factor in all of these was the concern by many officers as well as us that, that we not reveal uh, tactics of police officers. So it wouldn't reveal it to the bad guys on what to expect from an officer. We don't want to show that but we want to show the public some of the things that we do do without revealing how we are approaching and, and using these particular uh, weapons in our arsenal. Now the seventh one that we're working on and we'll be showing, uh, this one's been a, a little bit, a, quite a bit different. Right. And this was the one that we kind of, was, it was all leading up to. Mm -hmm. Do, would you say that preparing for this one was, a, was different than the ones that we've done before? I think it was. We, we, were, we, we always wanted to culminate with the, the use of lethal force but this one, we did not know how to do it on a scenario-based situation. It, it's just too difficult. Uh, so we thought about how do we portray this still in, in real life terms uh, so that people can understand in Edmond, even though we're a very safe place, we have extreme dangers that, uh, that face our officers on a daily basis. So we decided to review a number of cases where our officers have actually used deadly force uh, and what were the circumstances that, that presented themselves during, during these uh, episodes. Uh, so what we did was, out of all those that we did have, we tried to come up with a couple that would reflect kind of the broad range of these circumstances and how uh, quickly they can come upon an officer or, or how deadly a situation can be and how the officer's use of force can neutralize uh, that threat to, to the public in Edmond. Uh, so in, in trying to put it together, the approach was completely different because we did not have a script. We decided to let the officers tell their own story and, and let that be, uh, be the message in that it's, it's a real life circumstance. It's not a made up scenario, but these are circumstances that have impacted the lives of these officers and will always be a part of their lives. And, and yeah, it's a, you know, you're exactly right that we have up to this point, we've had simulations, actors acting this out, and, and we've been talking about the seventh one even from the get-go. Right. What are we going to do for this How one? do we get there? And we weren't sure how we were going to get there. Right. And so, and, and you know, being there at those interviews and talking with Gerald Dixon and uh, Jason Stearns, I'm, it, uh, it is, their stories are mesmerizing. I mean, right. you are hooked in. It's incredible that you don't really think about these dangers that police officers are in. You think, well, they got a gun. They're, they're mm -hmm. fine. They've got a gun, they've got pepper spray, they've got tasers, they've got, uh, I mean, how hard can it be to be a, a police officer? And their stories are the ones that make us really 
really appreciate what you guys do for us. So we really appreciate that. Thank you. Were there some moments during that production that really stick out? We, we've done seven of them. Anything in particular that stuck out about maybe like the difficulty of any of them? Maybe what was the hardest one that we've done? I think in my opinion, I don't know if it was the hardest thing we've done, but I kind of reflect back upon uh, Brian Weathers uh, as regard to trying to educate our citizens about uh, an intersection, kind of how to maneuver through this certain intersection. Uh, Brian had so many outtakes. Bad boy, bad boy, that's right, get you some. One of the things in Edmond is uh, turning, ah, one of the things in Edmond, driving in Edmond, no, I don't know. Ah, cut. Brian is a very great officer. He's a very funny officer. Um, I think Chief and uh, Jeff can contest that, but uh, I think the having fun conducting and making these videos was probably the best part of it, in my opinion. I think, of course, the best part is probably educating our citizens. But for us, having fun doing what we do uh, to try to educate our citizens was a really good part. Yeah. Yeah, I think by and large, officers are. are it's, we're not comfortable in that scenario, you know, being filmed and being asked to do our job on film. And, uh, and um, you helped a lot with that, making us comfortable in it, but that's where you saw the real personality of officers, you know, the um, uh, fun attitude, joking around, we, we had a good time. Yeah, yeah. You, know, you know I always love coming out to the training center and shooting video, <laughs> and uh, so uh, have a really good time with the police officers on that. And we did have a lot of fun. Uh, I always get worried when an officer no longer uh, can laugh uh, at the job and just the sometimes overwhelming things that that person may face. If they, you can't laugh at it, uh, then they start internalizing to the point where they can uh, cause themselves added stress, unnecessary stress. We have to, in our job, be able to enjoy our job. In fact, I said today, if, if you're not having a good time, you probably ought to go do something else. Yeah. Well, you know, and, and we've talked before, Chief, about how some of the stresses that a police officer goes through each and every day, they have to have that type of uh, kind of a... Release. Yeah, a release, right. exactly. Right. Um, you know, going back to the domestic dispute one, we, we actually shot in an apartment complex. They gave us permission to go in there and shoot, and uh, we had a couple of officers that actually pretended like this couple. We really didn't go to it on a call. We had to act this out, but... I know that when my wife looked at that video, she said, wow, they did a really good job. Uh, and that was Matt Harden and... Uh, and Patricia. Patricia DeVos, yeah. yes. Yeah. And can you tell me a little bit about, you know, they, they've had experience in this, not with actually real domestic disputes, but uh, how, 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 why were they so good at that? Jeff, I think... Through experience. Right. Uh, they, the two of them are, are police officers working the street every day. and. Uh, they are very good at putting their their combined experiences together in, into that one domestic scenario. They uh, they do it for us in the in the academy in our basic academy um, to help us train new police officers. They they uh, help us just like that. And uh, what's good about them for that is is as a police officer they can, they know how um, we want to respond, you know, and they can uh, they can help us test and evaluate that right. through their actions. This whole series has been about, you know, the use of force. P as police officers, what, how is it decided whether you're going to use pepper spray or whether you're going to use a taser or even a gun? Is there like a protocol that, that police officers have or something on that? Well, the, the short answer is, is the other person is dictating our level of force. We, we are responsive in nature to, to the actions of you. So um, now we have policies and procedures and, and there's federal and state laws, everything that, that um, govern use of police force. But um, our actions are di dictated by you. By, so um, compliance is obviously the, the, the fastest way to keep any force from happening. And we're always looking at what is reasonable under the circumstance. We don't want to lock our officers into just one use of force. So when we get back, we say, well, there's a little high, maybe a little bit low. You might could have used this. When we go back and review it, we're always looking at is, is the use that was applied here, was it in that range of reasonableness? And that's what the Supreme Court has dictated to us. They also realize that it's, it's always a fast evolving circumstances that the officers have to deal with. And you can't 
through 24 hour, I mean, looking at it back in hindsight, uh, second guess and say this is the only use of force you can use. What they've given us the authority, which I believe is the proper one, is always judge it on a reasonableness standard. Was the use of force in this circumstance reasonable? When you guys have a situation where any type of force is used, is that written up, reviewed by everyone in the police department? Are you guys looking at just how this police department responds or do you look how other police departments respond on a state and federal level? Do you guys learn from them as well? Absolutely. We review constantly for uses of force by other agencies. Um, internally, anytime uh, force is used on another by a police officer, incident reports are written and then uh, use of force reports are written and those are taken um, up to the chief's office for, for his review. There may be an internal inquiry depending on the circumstances and, the, and then there will be a use of force review. A form will be filled out, uh, be reviewed. We may bring together a group, review how that force was employed then ultimately I will, I will review it again and, and see if I thought it was reasonable under the circumstances. Jeff, you head up the training uh, out at the training center. Can you talk a little bit about how police officers are trained, uh, maybe like kind of an overview of some of the things that they do and, and how they are, how they learn, you know, to use the different tools that they have at their disposal? Yep. Uh, part of the Edmund Wave is continuing education. So we don't stop at just a basic academy. Um, every year, officers receive mandatory training hours that exceed the state's minimums um, by far. And so it doesn't matter what weapon system or tool that you have, um, you're going to be trained and retrained on that in a consistent basis. So we have, um, for instance, mandatory in-service driver training. We're one of the only agencies around that do that. Um, you're going to fire all of your weapons at least twice a year for qualification and training. Um, so we, we try and touch all areas of a police officer's life, not just skills-based where it's uh, self-defense or driver training or whatever, but where we touch on ethics and, and um, just trying to make us better officers all the way around. Well, guys, we really appreciate what you do for our city and, and uh, for the good job you guys do. We're proud to live in a city that has it's one of the safest cities in the country. Absolutely. Uh, the Edmund Way series is all on YouTube. You can go check that out. Just look up City of Edmund OK and you can find all of them there. Uh, I know that those are probably one of the most popular watched uh, segments on our YouTube channel. So thanks a lot, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate it. Well, Dwight, that was a very interesting look at some of the past segments of Edmund Way. Uh, can we take a look at the new one? Yeah, let's watch it. All right. On a normal night in November, Officer Gerald Dixon was on routine patrol in his district, checking the businesses in the area. After noticing two young men acting suspicious, first in the parking lot of a bowling alley, then shortly afterwards in the parking lot of a grocery store, he decided to stop and talk to them and to see what was going on. Little did Officer Dixon know that the next two minutes of his life would include a life or death struggle. It was November 15, 1990, and Officer Dixon was about to be the first Edmund police officer ever involved in a lethal force incident that resulted in a fatality. You have the training, but nothing can teach you to deal with that mental aspect of having to shoot some, possibly shoot someone or take their life. Ten years later, in the summer of 2001, another Edmund police officer would find himself in a life-threatening situation where the safety of fellow officers and an entire community was in danger. Officer Jason Stearns was one of the first police officers to respond to the calls of a man walking around in a neighborhood shooting a high-powered rifle. And I remember thinking, you know, he's coming right at us. You know, we're in the same spot he is, just directly north. He's running north at us. Um, then we heard some gunshots. It's not like any other job in America. It's been described by some as, as moments of tedium followed by uh, mere seconds of sheer terror. Uh, and, and a police officer never knows when those, those events of terror are going to take place. Uh, the worst thing that could happen to a police officer is that, that uh, he or she becomes lax and thinks that everything is routine because there is no such thing as a routine stop. Each, each event that an officer is involved with, the officer has to approach that event as what are the potential threats that exist because 
I, we have seen multiple, multiple events that, that turn from a routine stop and, and all of a sudden it, you're now facing a life or death situation. We unfortunately have one of the most uh, violent occupations that uh, anyone can undergo. In fact, in recent times, we're seeing an unprecedented number of officer killings. Just in the last, uh, last couple of months, we've had uh, multiple officer shootings and killings of officers throughout the country. When people uh, have a grudge against either their government or even their employer or sometimes even a family member, uh, they oftentimes take it out on a police officer because he's that first line of defense. We know we're in a dangerous business. We're trained to deal with those circumstances, but we have to have the tools available to answer to any potential threat that may present itself to our, to our officers. And that will sometimes require the use of deadly force. After observing some suspicious activity by two males late one night, Officer Gerald Dixon approached them in the parking lot of a grocery store. The one on my right had very nervous body language. He kept putting his hands in his pocket, uh, he kept shuffling his feet, and I asked him several times to keep his hands out of his pocket. Uh, and every time I'd ask him, he would take his hands out for maybe five to ten seconds, and then he'd go back to putting his hands in his pocket. As a precaution, Officer Dixon conducted a search on the nervous individual. As he patted down the suspect, he felt something in the man's waistband. It felt like the grip of a gun. And immediately when I touched it, the fight was on. As they struggled over the firearm, it discharged, shooting the suspect in the leg. Still, the man was able to fight Officer Dixon. The other suspect at the scene fled on foot, leaving behind his partner and Officer Dixon. Headquarters in the unit, sharp to 30, 30 bullet fire. Just received a call and advising gunshots. When you're involved in dangerous or possible deadly situations, you have to be concerned not only for your safety, but as well as the citizens that are around you. An employee from inside the nearby store approached the officer, asking if they could help. I told him, no, go back in the store and call the police department and tell them our officer needs assistance in the midst of this fight. We continued to fight, and as we, during that fight, a lot of people say, what do you think about when you're in that? I had a peace that came over me. It's like God spoke to me and says, everything's going to be all right. And I had that inner peace in that storm, because that's what it was to me. It was a storm. He knew that if he does not act properly, uh, if he does not respond to the threat that, that has been given to him, he is probably going to be uh, executed by the gentleman that he confronted. He was well trained. Uh, he, was in well, he was well conditioned. As a result, he was able to not only just to hold on, but was able to overcome an adversary that was intent on killing him. And at one time he had his gun pointed at the center of my head. And the thing that kept him from being able to pull the trigger again was the holes that I had learned through defensive tactics. The two men also struggled over possession of Officer Dixon's own firearm. During the altercation, the gun discharged and a bullet entered Officer Dixon's lower left leg. Now both wounded, the men continued to fight for control of the weapon. By applying the training that he had received as a police officer, Dixon was able to gain control of his firearm and shoot the suspect, ending the fight. Wounded and bleeding, the police officer hopped over to his patrol car where he was able to rest on the hood and call for help. That quarter has been shot! That quarter has been shot! It had all happened in a matter of seconds. I called out on the radio at 12.02 to check out, check, it said I was checking these guys. And at 12.04 is when I called back out on the radio telling headquarters that I've been shot. Officers and paramedics arrived onto the scene. Officer Dixon was taken to the hospital. The downed suspect subsequently died due to the injuries sustained from the bullet wound. The other suspect involved later returned to the parking lot and was arrested. This is not something that Gerald ever wanted to do, but he was trained that if these circumstances presented themselves, he had no alternative but to defend himself and take the necessary action to neutralize that threat that was presented to him. Lethal force is, is one that we are most times reluctant to use, and it's seldom, seldomly used 
but it's one that we know sometimes is absolutely mandatory. Uh, we are trained very closely to follow Supreme Court precedent, which says that force can only be used when it's reasonable. So we train our officers to very closely follow the reasonable, reasonableness standard that if under the circumstances, if they feel their life or the life of another is in jeopardy and it's reasonable to use force, they will use force if necessary. In the early evening on June 22, 2001, Officer Jason Stearns was working a vehicle accident when the call came over the radio that a man was wandering in an Edmond neighborhood with a high-powered rifle. We had just gotten patrol rifles. It was just the very beginning of our patrol rifle program, and there were only a few on the street. Um, I don't know how many there were that night, maybe only one or two, and I happened to have one, so I decided it was probably a good idea to start heading that way. Admin 911. Yes, the, the guy with the gun. Ma'am. Yes. Then I'll go outside. I won't. More calls were coming into the 911 dispatch center that there was a man with a gun firing shots. Uh, it looked like he had a uh, rifle with him. There's a park right there, and somebody had seen this guy walk through the park. John, she said this lady just saw him run through that park. And it's 6 o'clock on a Friday, I believe. Um, so the place should be just packed full of kids, but for some reason it wasn't that day, which is probably a good thing. Officer Stearns and fellow officer Kyle Stoy converged on the small neighborhood park but did not see the armed suspect. They hurried along a neighborhood street, checking backyards and surrounding areas. And we started hearing some, some shots. Be advised that uh, one of the residents did, advised that he did hear one shot earlier. The first shots that we heard were only just a backyard or two away and it was a high caliber rifle and, um, and we could tell that this was, this was a very real deal and, uh, and that, it, that it wasn't a joke. So, Unknown to the officers at the time, the suspect had entered the backyard of an Edmond resident. On this warm evening, the homeowner was sanding a door and had no chance of escape as the gunman shot and killed him. I hear gunshots. Only a few homes away, Officer Stearns and Officer Stoy raced towards the sound of the gunfire. Moving from house to house, from backyard to backyard, jumping fences, at a heightened sense of awareness is, is pretty physically taxing. I mean, it's physically taxing just to do that without being somewhat in the middle of a gunfight, uh, but moving with equipment that you don't usually move with, uh, moving in an area that you don't usually move in, and in an environment that is pretty hostile at that point um, was, was pretty physically demanding. Um, but it's one of those things where you don't really have a choice. You just gotta do what you gotta do and get done what you need to get done. Other police officers began to arrive in the neighborhood as the gunman continued to wander through yards, sometimes disappearing into the backyards of innocent civilians. The other officers at the scene had, had said that he was running northbound, which we were on the north side of, of this guy, and uh, like a street over. And I remember thinking, you know, he's coming right at us. You know, we're in the same spot he is, just directly north. He's running north at us. The armed suspect entered another backyard where he fired upon a second victim, wounding him. They were sounded like they were coming right at us, and so we we kind of hunkered down, got into a position to where we could defend ourselves and, and waited for him to come out. He never did. Instead, the gunman turned back and walked through the front yard of the wounded civilian's home. The man spotted a woman and her son who came outside to see what was going on. The gunman raised his rifle and tried to shoot towards the woman and boy, but his gun misfired and jammed. From about 75 yards away, Officer John Ziegler spotted the suspect and fired his pistol, hitting him in the leg. Unable to move freely now, the gunman dragged himself behind a bush and tried to clear his disabled rifle. At this point, Officer Stearns and Officer Stoy had converged on the area around the downed suspect. We're yelling commands at him. There's, a, there's another resident across the street that heard all the commotion was coming out to see what was going on. Um, he actually got up on his roof and was yelling kind of a play-by-play -play of what was going on. You know, we're, we're yelling at this guy to go back inside. We're yelling at the suspect to drop his rifle. He's not complying. Um, we did have a few cars that were driving down the street. We were trying to coordinate, you know, people, other officers approaching to block off the, the roads. But we've got people driving up and down and we're yelling for them to stop. And they're kind of stopping right in front of the suspect, you know, just a few yards. And then we're telling them to go and they're not really sure what to do and we're trying to worry about the guy with the rifle. So there's a, 
There's a lot going on. It was very dynamic, I guess. And Though immobile, the suspect was still able to handle his rifle as he tried to reload it. The fear of the gunman shooting a fellow police officer or an innocent bystander was on the mind of Officer Stearns. At any point, he could level a gun at any direction and, and shoot any of us. You know, I know at that point, his intentions are not good. You know, he's got a, a weapon capable of penetrating any type of body armor or any kind of, kind of equipment that we have. Um, we know at that point that he has shot multiple rounds in the open air in a neighborhood. So I was in fear for my life, in fear for the lives of the other guys that were out there, in fear for the civilians, in fear for people that were just sitting in their houses. You know, maybe didn't even know what was going on because any one of those rounds could penetrate a brick wall and, and kill somebody inside. So there were a lot of fears. Hunkered down behind the bush, the suspect ignored the commands of police officers and continued to reload his rifle. And before he was able to fire any more rounds, um, myself and Officer Stoy both fired on the, on the subject, hitting and killing him at that time. There was no option. You know, there was no other option of what we could do. You know, that was the last line of defense. After an officer is involved in a shooting, this is sometimes one of the most stressful events that an officer can undergo. Uh, one, he's under great stress. Uh, usually there are feelings of doubts, uncertainty. Uh, you're always questioning yourself, did you do the right thing, even though it may be completely appropriate in the circumstances. But because of the, of the nature of how we conduct these uh, investigations, it puts additional strain on the officer. When an officer is involved in an on-duty shooting, he is a subject of both a criminal investigation and an internal investigation. First, a report is prepared for a potential criminal investigation against the officer. The report is given to the district attorney and the officer is also placed on administrative leave. The district attorney examines the report and determines if the force was reasonable under the circumstances. Also, an internal investigation over the shooting is conducted. Officer statements are obtained and firearms are closely examined. And I, the internal investigation was a challenge for me because here I am, a police officer, I'm the one that has been reading rights to people and then I'm laying in my hospital bed and they come up there and they clear my room out and then they Mirandize me and I'm saying, what? I didn't do anything wrong. And so that, that, that was a big challenge, the internal investigation part of it. It is a tremendous burden that an officer has to undergo even though in most cases and in, in, in the cases of of uh, Edmund that we've had, we've never had a case of improper use of deadly force. Uh, it still is tremendous burden on the officer. Protecting the lives of the public has been something Officer Dixon has wanted to do for a very long time. Ever since I was five years old. After his incident in November of 1990, Officer Dixon did not return to duty until February of 1991. Even then, he was only assigned light duty. The bullet that entered his lower left leg that unforgettable night tore through his Achilles tendon, resulting in a loss of flexibility in his foot, leg, and ankle area. Because of this, Gerald would have to go through intense physical therapy before he could return to patrolling Edmund streets. Even to this day, there are some n noticeable effects of it even to this day. Officer Dixon's major obstacle, though, wasn't dealing with the physical pain to his gunshot wound, or the therapy afterwards. My big issue coming back was being able to go to the crime scene. And I had to have a few of my close friends here at the police department go with me. Uh, that was my biggest challenge, to go back to that and see it all over again. I know from personal experience that that event will be with him for the rest of his life. Uh, oftentimes those are life-changing events. I've seen officers that, that uh, literally go through a depression cycle that lasts for years. I've seen other officers that bounce back immediately. Uh, what I do know is that it is something that none of them ever want to, to occur. Most, an overwhelming majority of people have never fired their weapons. I've drawn my, weapons many t my weapon many times, but I've never actually fired my weapon uh, in, a, in making an arrest or being under an assault. Uh, and that's true for almost most police officers as well. Uh, so they are well-trained, 
They know how to take the necessary steps if they have to use deadly force. Most do not want that to occur. We never want them to believe, though, that it's, it is not something that is optional. It is not something that you should resist if the facts and the circumstances call for it because you not only can get yourself killed, but you can get members of the public also killed if you don't take the necessary uh, step. Just as if Jason Stearns, Officer Jason Stearns, had been reluctant to use deadly force on the particular day that he did, more than likely we could have had other people killed in the Edmond community. Officer Jason Stearns and four other officers who were involved in the incident in 2001 returned to duty on the 4th of July, almost two weeks after the neighborhood shooting. It might not have been the best day to come back um, due to all the fireworks going on. Um, I remember hearing fireworks, which sounded like gunshots to me all day long the day I came back to work. So that might have not been the best idea. To help him face the aftermath of his incident, Officer Stearns relied on other officers who had been involved in similar situations. I had talked to um, another uh, sergeant at the time who had been through another shooting and talked to him and said, hey, this is what's going on with me. And he said, man, I, I've, I've, I've had that same thing happen to me or this is what happened to me. And so I was able to talk to somebody who had been through it and, and done that. Um, it's hard to get a good, accurate picture or know exactly what another officer's going through if you haven't been through it yourself. So, you know, it was nice to be able to talk to somebody. To talk with someone, to know that they have been there, that they've been able to get through the process and come out okay is also a big benefit to any officer that's involved in a, in a high traumatic situation. And again, the use of deadly force is probably the most traumatic incident that we undergo. A lot of it, I think, is, is mental preparation, you know, preparing yourself, preparing your family, for something like that. The key to preparing for the various types of situations an admin officer can encounter is ongoing and specialized officer training. We, we have found that when we undergo stressful events, we always revert back to our basic training. Because of that, in Edmund, the Edmund way we believe is to train our officers repeatedly, much beyond the minimum standards, so that when any event pre presents itself, we will have the proper training regardless of what uh, the tool is within the officer's uh, toolkit, be it uh, pepper spray, be it a taser, uh, be it a, a, a firearm. All of these require specialized training as to when they should be used and how they should be used. I take defensive tactics very serious, even to this day, uh, because you work the way you train. If you train hard, you work hard. And that's the attitude that I take. I realized how important the tools were that we, we used. Well, I'd always heard that, you know, coming up through the ranks and, you know, it's an important tool and yeah, 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 I can shoot. I shoot enough to qualify, which is great, but is that enough? So <clears throat> after that, I realized just how important they are. Um, went through firearms instructor school and, you know, became more than proficient with, with any firearm that I carry. Today, both Officer Stearns and Officer Dixon tell their story to new recruits training to be Edmund police officers, hoping to pass on advice that could help future officers if and when they face similar situations. My advice to new officers is to take your training serious, get as much range time, range time as you can, get as much as physical training, stay in shape. That's the main thing stay in good physical shape because if you're more physically in shape it also helps your mental ability as well in those challenging situations because it takes it all and then get the training good training and we offer that here at the Edmond Police Department. The life of a police officer is is not necessarily an easy one. Uh, we often see the, the debris of human life that others have discarded uh, just this week I believe we've had three people die of overdoses, one with a hypodermic needle stuck in her arm. Uh, we, we've had other overdoses that have occurred this week. These are people who are going through life's challenges and are just not able to cope. We are there to clean that up. We're there when people are having fights, they're hitting each other with beer bottles, stabbing each other. We're the ones that have to separate them, try to make sense of, out of all this. We have the 
uh, babies that, that we've had in the last couple of years, two babies that have been killed, that have been beaten viciously by, by uh, their so-called parents that are supposed to be there to protect them. And we have to go in and clean up that mess. Public doesn't see it. They see the sanitized version that's on the news. Okay, somebody got, got killed, uh, a child was uh, brutalized or uh, died as a result of injuries. They don't see the blood, they don't see the brutality that's involved. Our officers experience it firsthand. They're the first ones there, they're the ones that have to clean it up. One of the most difficult things that an officer has to do is to notify a family member that, that uh, a loved one has died. Uh, I can remember when a, when a highway patrol uh, trooper was killed and I had to notify the widow. Probably the most difficult thing I have had to do. Uh, and an officer has to do that on a regular basis. We're, we're constantly notifying loved ones that uh, their, their loved one has passed away, uh, has been the subject of, of violence or perhaps subject of, a, of an overdose. It's an unfortunate circumstance, but that's the calling that we have been given. What we have to be careful because of the things that we see, the cruelty that's exhibited by people against each other is that it does not harden our hearts. Uh, we are there with a calling to be servant leaders. And we also have to be very careful that, that what we see, what we observe, does not carry back home to our own families. That it does not affect our own uh, attitudes toward our job, that it does not make us so callous that uh, we don't reach out and help others uh, and remember the, whole, the reasons why we've been called to this job. People look at Edmond as that nothing bad happens in Edmond. I'm telling you, crime happens in Edmond. Most of it's property crime, but some of the other crimes, the personal crimes, if you will, do happen in Edmond. Uh, and we have to deal with those on a day-to-day -day basis. It's just, it's just that it doesn't always make the news, but we deal with them on a day-to-day -day basis. And we have to be aware of those things. And when I make tra traffic stops, I make the traffic stop being aware of what's going on and at the same time uh, treating that pe person with dignity and respect because that's what we should do is uh, work on being courteous to the uh, public until they dictate that they want to be treated otherwise and then we handle it as quickly and as appropriately as possible. Edmond is one of the safest communities in the United States, but unfortunately it does not mean that we're immune uh, from potential threats that have occurred here. Uh, the cases of uh, Officer Stearns and Officer Dixon uh, demonstrated that on occasion we've even had to use lethal force here in Edmond. Uh, the post office shootings that we've had and, and the other situations where our officers had been in life and death struggles. Uh, we, we oftentimes present ourselves as, as a very, very safe community, almost immune from violence, but uh, to the officer, he has to work extremely hard and, is, and sees that that is not necessarily the case. Uh, but he works, he works very hard, uh, very diligent to keep this the safest community that we have in Oklahoma, and it is the number one safest community in Oklahoma for violent crimes. We intend to keep it that way, but one reason is because of the great training uh, that we have, the preparation that the officers have, and the, and the attention to detail that, that they undergo to keep this uh, the safest community in Oklahoma. What, what is the Edmund Way? Edmund Way is that, that we are not trying to do what is average. We are striving for excellence, and we believe that in everything that we do be it from the hiring of the best, the most intelligent, the most capable people, the people with the most common sense who are servant leaders, who want to be there because they're willing to take risks but they're not thrill seekers, who are people who are dedicated to serving their community, uh, the people who have the best interests of their community at heart, who are willing to work hard uh, to make this a better community and that are willing to make the sacrifices necessary in order to be not a good police officer, but to be an outstanding police officer. This video series was produced by the Edmond Police Department and the COPS Leadership Council. To learn more about the Leadership Council and its partnership with the Edmond Police Department, please visit edmondpd.com or call 359-4440. 
You can watch past episodes of The Edmund Way on YouTube. Just search City of Edmund OK. Dwight, those are some incredible stories. It really makes you appreciate what the police department does for our city. It really does, and you do a great work on that. But uh, listen, I appreciate you joining me right here on Your Edmund. Hey, no problem. Thanks, Eric. I'm going to do your final zoom in. Thank you. Now, on a serious note, if you do see a police officer in Edmond, if you can, stop them and thank them for what they do. They have an incredibly difficult job. And in fact, they do their job very well. Edmond is one of the safest cities in America, so be sure that you take care of that. Well, I guess that wraps up another episode of Your Edmond. I hope to see you on another episode next month. <laughs>